Hello, everybody, and welcome to How Are You, Sweden, my channel here on YouTube. And normally I do my shows in Swedish, but today I have a very special guest all the way from uh, United Kingdom, uh, Dr. Sunetra Gupta. Welcome to the show. Very pleased to be here. And I have so many, maybe too many questions to ask you. Uh, I'm calling you from Sweden, uh, a country that last year dealt with the pandemic in a different way than did most of the world, avoiding hard lockdowns and mandatory masks. And you are a professor, of course, of epidemiology, researcher in the field of viral and bacterial infections, and one of the three main signers of the Great Barrington Declarations, which we will come to in a second. First, please tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your research. Um, well, I uh, work on infectious diseases, of course, but I started off um, essentially as someone who was interested in applying mathematical ideas to the study of biology. So I came from, um, I mean, my, my original interest in the sciences was um, kind of triggered by how uh, useful mathematics can be in understanding physical systems. And while I was an undergraduate, I realized you could actually apply mathematics, not just to physics and chemistry, but also to biology. That's where I started. And then, so that's what I've been doing all along is trying to use mathematics to shed light on biological problems and very uh, quickly became interested in infectious disease systems where you can um, use these methods very nicely. And um, most of my work has been on how pathogens evolve um, and uh, the various kind of population structures that emerge. Some pathogens like measles have no variation, whereas others like influenza are variable. And in developing these ideas, um, one of the, I mean, apart from the epidemiological insights one gains, um, one of the things that's been very satisfying is that our models for flu have actually been translated into um, a blueprint for a new type of um, universal flu vaccine mm -hmm. and for which we, you know, which we patented and licensed and are now in the process of developing. So, um, so while my own expertise is as a theoretician, I have, we have at the moment in our research group, a thriving laboratory, which um, works mainly on flu, but of course, in the last year, uh, Craig Thompson, who runs that um, uh, end, end of our um, research group enterprise, has, made, has also been working on COVID. So mm -hmm. we have expertise, this is almost as an apology to, but all to contextualize when people say, oh, she's a theoretician. I work on the theory, but um, we have a lot of expertise in the immunology and, and the laboratory work that goes into this. And we've taken our ideas all the way to a translational level where, um, you know, we hopefully um, will be able to develop a new type of flu vaccine. So we have, there is a broad range of expertise, not to mention, of course, uh, general public health strategy, which I've always been interested in. Yeah, I have nothing but admiration for your work. And I forgot to mention, I am also a physician uh, currently training to be a psychiatrist. I last year um, uh, got my PhD in clinical micro, micro, microbiology, but since have changed roots. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about the Great Barrington Declaration. Why what is that? And why did you choose to take a public stance um, on this issue during the pandemic? So it was almost exactly a year ago that um, uh, the awful realization occurred um, to me that many European countries were going to go into lockdown. And um, I was very worried, just at a very visceral level, about how this would impact 
on um, poorer communities in these countries. And more broadly, I, I um, was worried about how other countries, such as India, where I come from, um, who absolutely could not afford to go into lockdown, might think this was the only way to control this or, or respond to this crisis. And I knew that it would immediately cause a loss of lives. And that's what happened in India and South Africa and other places that chose to go into lockdown. Now, when China and Italy um, went into lockdown or parts of it, um, that was motivated, I feel, by slightly different sentiment, which was to prevent the virus from escaping. And while that's maybe not practical, it was a, it is noble in its intent, but to lock down country to stop it getting in and, and then also but further to that, locking it down to stop it spreading within the country uh, seemed to me to be a, not a very sensible strategy and where the costs of that strategy would be felt immediately among the underprivileged. Mm. So that was where, um, that was a year ago now. Yeah. Um, but I thought the best way to try and get a, a dialogue, which is the most important thing, you know, that was my feeling that doesn't translate immediately into a recommendation. But what I felt there needed to be a dialogue surrounding this, which um, was grounded in a, a, a broader understanding of the population dynamics of this disease. So a lot of the recommendations were centered on a particular uh, realization of a model yeah. with a certain set of parameters. And I felt at that point, my, the best way I could intervene was to show that actually a whole range of other model, I mean, other same model, but with different parameters could fit the scenario. And it remains the case that we can explain everything that's happened so far simply on the basis of herd immunity, or we could explain it or attempt to explain it. I think that would be more difficult as a result of interventions. But the truth is that models can only tell you how, what the possibilities are. They can't, unless you have the data, you can't really tell what's, what is causing what. Um, and I felt that that was something are you talking mm -hmm. about the model coming out, I think, in early spring? Was it February, March from Ferguson? And the, the is that the model yes. that was? Uh, yes, so that's, that, that, that's exactly the same. You know, that's a fundamental kind of model that one would use to uh, on, in these pandemics. But so there's no actual difference between the model they used, although it's a large computer simulation um, and the very simple uh, deterministic model that we um, then put in the public domain last year mm -hmm. to say that actually there are a variety of scenarios that fit what is currently happening. Whereas what the Imperial College Group had done is pick a certain scenario. Because mm -hmm. when you make a complex model, what you do is you say, well, which is the best fit to the data? Mm -hmm. And at the time, the only um, data they had was the Diamond Princess data and whatever was coming out of Wuhan. So, you know, I'm not saying that, and this has always been the case, there's no real disagreement between us and the fundamental way in which this is spreading. It's just uh, that they chose a particular scenario. Mm -hmm. And what I was saying is there are a number of scenarios that fit this. So that's where I started in March. That was last, I can't believe it was a year ago. Yeah. And then as time wore on, it seemed to me that um, this sort of fascination with lockdowns was reaching, you know, a different dimension. And therefore, I realized that I could not just put out scientific ideas that I needed to come out and say on the basis of these scientific ideas and, and on the basis of what we can might at that point imagine the costs of lockdown already felt in many parts of the world, mm -hmm. that we needed to think of a different strategy. And quite independently, myself, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Kuldorf, and many other people, of course, had this idea that maybe the 
the best solution would be to focus protection on those who are vulnerable to death and disease from COVID and, and allow the natural course of the disease to um, occur so that we then, you know, we were, that would be a way of using uh, population level immunity, exploiting our knowledge about how these pathogens, um, the, the epidemic behavior of these pathogens um, in order to reduce the risk again to the vulnerable. So the focus is always, how do we reduce the risk to the vulnerable population? Because uh, otherwise, you know, public health problems are about people who are vulnerable. So that's always the focus. But what people have failed to realize is that the buildup of herd immunity is something that protects the vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. And the sooner we can establish that, the sooner, the closer we are to the situation we enjoy with the other seasonal coronaviruses. Yeah. Um, as a Swedish person, I am on the one hand sad and frustrated about how we, in parallel to so many other countries, failed to protect the vulnerable, older and sick population. I mean, the median, median age of those who died was around 84 years old. Um, but at the same time, I'm grateful that we didn't have a hard lockdown and that we didn't, we weren't forced to wear masks on the streets or we were able to live our lives pretty normally during uh, all of 2020. And I think now uh, Sweden are using more and more res restrictions and politicians are calling out for harder measures, a Swedish lockdown. And I think there is a naivety among the Swedish population that they don't really know what that means. Can you please, please tell us what does life on, what is life under lockdown and what are the harms of this system? Well, first of all, there is this fantasy that lockdowns protect the vulnerable. And that's not true. Lockdowns have harmed the vulnerable people. Lockdowns expose vulnerable people. Because what we have enjoyed as lockdown in many, in, in you know, not just developed, but developing countries, what is a protection of the wealthy, or at least, um, you know, uh, people who have enough resources to be able, maybe they're not wealthy, but, you know, just generally the middle classes um, to different degrees. Obviously, if you're very wealthy, then none of it matters. What do you do? You just sit in your beautiful estate and uh, it's kind of fun, actually. Um, if you are in just a, or an academic like myself, um, you know, I live in a nice house in Oxford. My daughters came back during lockdown and worked at home, which, uh, you know, was, was really quite a privilege. It was, I mean, it was wonderful to have them back. We have a nice garden, we have a dog, uh, been walking, it's, it's fine. Lockdown is not a problem um, for uh, the people who have the privilege. Uh, you know, the, the fortune, uh, are fortunate enough to have nice enough accommodation, um, you know, other than the fact that we can't go to art galleries and concerts. Oh, well, there's always recordings, you know, it's not a problem. And when you think about that, when you contrast that to what's actually happening, obviously there's, I won't even, I mean, we could start with the, the developing world. Mm -hmm. I mean, an image that returns to me is of um, there was a report of a 90-year-old woman walking home, this is last year, this time, from Delhi, where she sells toys on the pavement, 90 years old. And, you know, what do you make from toys on the pavement? Just maybe enough to eat on that day. Some days she probably doesn't eat or didn't eat. And she was walking back to her village because she could no longer do that. So this is the reality in most of the rest of the world. And in, in this country, the idea that lockdowns protected vulnerable people is a, is a real fallacy because what happened, and they keep saying, oh, look at all these poor people who died. Well, that's funny because those poor people are the people who were obliged during lockdown to go out to earn a living. Mm -hmm. 
and classed as essential workers. So they drove buses, they cleaned the hospitals, and not surprisingly, some of them who shouldn't have been doing that, obviously most people don't actually die from this disease, but some of them had comorbidities, had diabetes, were overweight or obese or whatever it is, um, had asthma and should not have been out there. So instead of protecting those people, we protected the middle classes who are now saying, oh, okay, do we really need to lift lockdown? Um, maybe, you know, okay, we do want our kids to go to school. But the idea that lockdowns protect the vulnerable is as a fantasy. Also with the elderly here, I mean, okay, maybe we protected some of them, not very well from dying of COVID, but then we sentenced them to these you know, to live their rest of their lives in isolation. Mm -hmm. And um, without the, the one thing that would matter, I imagine when I'm old, I would just like to touch my children to be holding my hand. Um, that's the one thing we deprive them of. So lockdowns do not protect the vulnerable in any sense. Mm -hmm. They may, the only way they might protect the vulnerable is by reducing infection. But that too is called into serious question, thankfully, by um, examples such as Sweden, which didn't go into this, that kind of lockdown and, and achieved not very um, dissimilar results to places that did. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the protection of the vulnerable, and you feel that how is the situation for children who is, as a group, also vulnerable? And of course, uh, children coming from households where, where they are already not protected very well. How have they suffered through this uh, year in Great Britain, do you feel? I mean, I think we should hang our heads in shame. Absolutely hang our heads in shame. I mean, in, in terms of, as I said, the, the thoughts, the, the horrible images that crowded in my head last March. Uh, you know, I said, I've talked about India and slums uh, around the world where this would have a devastating impact but also I thought of the child for whom in this country even going to school is the only sort of relief from a household that's dysfunctional the only place where they get a proper meal um, and we have just abandoned those children it seems to me um, not to mention, of course, uh, other children who maybe, you know, I mean, don't live in such terrible circumstances, but to not go to school is um, a, an extraordinary sort of imposition yeah. on that age group where, you know, if we all were equipped to give them what they need at home, that would be fine. And, you know, maybe some of them have benefited from having their parents teach them rather than their teachers. Mm -hmm. But this is no way to live. And But what is actually really breaks my heart is watching them go to school and then be told you can't sit with your friend and you have to wear a face mask and you have to mm -hmm. um, swab yourself. Yeah. Uh, all of this could have been avoided if we had focused, if we'd protected those who are vulnerable to inf um, death from infection. Right. I think we have totally um, failed on our duties to children, and I uh, can't. Um, I don't understand how this, how people can tolerate that kind of harm to children. Uh, I agree, and and the, in, in the Sweden, Sweden kept schools open uh, one from one year, as that's kindergarten to sixteen years, uh, all schools all the time open every day, and uh, we have seen. Uh, very few serious cases, very few uh, even deaths. I don't know if, if there are any real deaths from COVID-19 among children, I'm sure, but, but very, very few. I mean, we're talking about millions of children who have- It's negligible. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's not a disease for children, it's a disease for the old uh, mainly and for those who have preconditions, uh, diseases, but still, how though would you, Recommend and how do you do in practice to keep to protect the vulnerable while um, young and healthy can can keep living their lives? Do you have any concrete suggestions? How would you manage the situation 
where you live, for example. So yes, absolutely. Now, um, so I, I never got to where the Great Barrington Declaration came in, but it was obviously um, a bunch of us getting together and saying, okay, let's make this a concrete proposal that people can consider and, and open up a debate. And on that website, you will find some suggestions for how we think this might be affected. But the truth is that these, I mean, I can, and I can mention some of them to you. So first of all, uh, what we are doing during lockdown in this country mm. is making everyone stay at home. Yeah. So it seems rather illogical to say that oh, we can't make people over a certain age or those who are over a certain age and have some are in bad health. Uh, why can't we oblige them to stay at home? We're obliging everyone to stay at home at this point. So it seems that a big part of protecting the vulnerable would require them to stay at home, just like everyone is doing right now in this country, um, or to you know take walks, maybe with socially distanced walks, or you know, well, I hardly need to tell you in Sweden, you know, you you laid out those recommendations. But that that seems to me to be the largest part of how you would protect the vulnerable. And I, since it is a subset of lockdown, it seems rather um, bizarre that it should be dismissed as not being possible. Furthermore, that would only have to occur over the period uh, where the epidemic was raging. And, and as soon as, which should be you know, over by three, maybe six months, Right now, we've locked everyone up for much longer than that in many parts of the world and stopped children from going to school. So that, that would be the biggest part of it. And most developed countries, that's uh, completely feasible because we don't, um, you know, that most elderly people live on their own or people over the age of 65 don't live with young people. So that's possible. And then there are families where that's not the case. Some of those families, you can still um, isolate the grandparents for a while uh, for that period of time. And in families who live in very small cramped quarters, which shouldn't be happening anyway, we would have to put special measures in. Mm -hmm. So we maybe evacuate, and I like using that word because that is what we do mm -hmm. in situations of crisis. You could evacuate the elderly or the vulnerable to somewhere uh, and give them, a, you know, a very nice, uh, I think Muge Chevik called it um, luxury evacuation. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you get, create a luxury experience out of evacuation. Yeah. And we certainly had the money to do that, which yeah. we threw away on test track and trace and, and all sorts of mm. um, activities that were, I think, doomed to fail. So I think that's, that's a very large part of it is you just pay the people who are vulnerable. So you do the opposite of lockdown. You tell the bus driver who has diabetes and is obese, you say, you are going to stay at home and we are going to deliver a lot of food and um, give you lots of money to stay at home because that overall we better food protects you. And, um, you know, in the overall is, um, a lower expenditure than what we tried to do by keeping suppressing infection in the community. Yeah, yeah, and I like also how you uh, mention on your website how, for example, in schools, if they are kept open or, or reopened, then teachers, of course, who are over the age of sixty or have comorbidities, they can they can be at home teaching or helping other teachers in uh, administrative work or something like that. So they exactly, I'm sure you can find solutions to that problem. It seems to be a smaller magnitude of problem. And but what we need, of course, are experts mm -hmm. on the ground to tell us exactly how you do it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not an expert in that area. If people assessed this suggestion um, and, and said, look, actually, it's not going to work, then I would, of course, accept that. But what happened instead was that people dismissed it outright you know, someone, you know, I was just watching Anthony Fauci saying, this is a nonsense. That's nonsense, he said. I mean, is that a 
reasonable way for anyone to react to a suggestion that you know should at least be debated and discussed yeah anthony fauci of course being the the leader of the pan pandemic uh, restrictions and politics in in the us and um I mean, the Great Barrington Declaration it's, it's, was founded by you and very prominent researcher in, uh, in uh, Harvard and in Stanford, and also signed by Nobel laureate um, uh, Michael Levitt, among other very high profile researchers in infectious diseases and many other, other fields. Are you surprised that you didn't get to come to the government, pro pro get your proposition out there and have a serious debate about different ways to handle the pandemic? Are you surprised that there was such a hard drive to the other way to, to go to lockdown and, and these policies that now are so disastrous uh, for, for many countries? Yes, it's mystifying. I mean, of course, um, myself and then another um, uh, a researcher at Oxford, Carl Hennigan, who um, is also, has been very, very active in uh, showing the data, you know, showing evidence-based medicine. Um, uh, he's a head of evidence-based medicine here in Oxford, and, and he has taken a very data-driven approach to this whole process. And um, we were both asked to, um, it's no secret now, to uh, present our ideas at a cabinet meeting, but um, they were then immediately dismissed and um, did not get to be debated at all. There was no debate. Debate was actively shut down. Mm -hmm. um, so that's mystifying to me. In fact, what we, happened instead was a series of ad hominem attacks and campaigns were launched against us. We don't have very much more time, but I would like to ask you just a few more questions. And one argument that proponents of a Swedish lockdown use uh, is the, that the new variants, we have the British one, the Brazilian one, the South African one, I think even we have a Swedish one, um, <laughs> are so dangerous and, and, cause, and pose such an Im imminent threat to our health that we need to now to shut down just, you know, just for a few weeks and, and then open up again. And what is the scientific basis for these, the, 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 the threat that these variants pose? I mean, are they more lethal? Are they scarier? Um, I think the scientific basis for panic on that front is very flimsy. So this is an area that I particularly work on, which is how do pathogens evolve under selection pressure uh, from obviously our immune systems and also other things that we do. And while, so again, there is a whole range of possibilities here. Why did this pathogen um, almost uniformly around the world develop you know, certain or, or the ones that succeeded had certain mutations like the Nelly and the Eek mutations, which some of which may increase transmissibility and some of which are clearly allow them to evade certain um, antibody responses. Now, we know that under selection, pathogens will evolve. And, but the likelihood that they would evolve to be something hugely monstrous is very low. The likelihood is that um, some of these mutations might have conferred a small transmission advantage, which in a competitive landscape always causes that variant to take over. So it's sort of part of the natural dynamic of pathogen populations is that you do get um, if you have something that has a slightly higher transmission um, or has a slight transmission advantage, it will come to dominate. It's called competitive exclusion. It doesn't have to have a very high transmission advantage. Mm. And that's broadly what you, we are seeing. We are watching certain variants come to dominate, sort of take over 
but not because they are far more aggressive. It's because they're just a little bit better yeah. at transmitting. Um, with regard to virulence, there's very little evidence that there's any increase in virulence. And then immune evasion is, is of course, an issue, but, um, and so the pathogens will evolve to evade immunity if they can. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there has been some uh, degree of immune evasion, particularly in the E to K um, mutation. Um, but that does not cause us to lose immunity to um, severe disease and death. And in any case, we know from coronaviruses that immunity to reinfection is, is incomplete. So we're constantly reinfected by these viruses, but they don't cause any harm. No. So if so all of this conforms completely, fits very nicely into a general model for how coronaviruses uh, circulate at equilibrium. And we have four coronaviruses which are doing that. Um, so I don't see any cause for this level of alarm no. uh, surrounding these variants. I mean, when they were first detected, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, there could have been a little bit of caution exercised. Now we are, you know, two, three months down the road. And in any case, the plausible, most plausible explanation was always that they weren't going to be terribly more frightening. It's very unlikely we'll suddenly release this sort of monstrous new variant. Okay, that's reassuring. And in, I mean, another question about this that I would like to ask you is, what is happening to science right now? You mentioned ad hominem attacks from other scientists being mounted against uh, the great Barrington Declaration against your, yourself, I think, have also experienced some of these attacks. And right now in Sweden, there is a professor that is being um, almost persecuted on social media for having uh, written an article uh, about COVID-19 with some results that some persons uh, didn't like. And, and he has also in, uh, gotten threats uh, to his person and has now decided to quit doing science about COVID-19. And there are also uh, exclusion and censorship on the social media platforms from scientists who are well recognized around the world and, and they have been unable to, to speak and get their ideas out there. So what is happening right now to science? Do you have any ideas about that? I think it's disgraceful. I'm glad at least the Karolinska took a stand against it. And I think it's very important and it's not happening um, that universities take a very serious stand against this kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I have not met with much success in, in asking for a you know, concerted effort to lay down some guidelines for what, I mean, against what is frank defamation frank defamation and as you say threats well, not from other well threats I don't know but defamation from other academic colleagues should not be acceptable obviously you can't do much about social media in terms of the general public can issue threats of, of kind all kinds and I, I obviously I wouldn't go so far as to say that there have been threats in academia but but the the language of dismissal has been absolutely of the lowest level. Um, ad hominem attacks and you know just general kind of statements as to this won't work or this is pseudoscience or disinformation. Um, it's staggering that people have come uh, out like that. And you know when I look at some of the accusations leveled against me, um, they're really quite ridiculous. I mean, for example, um, apparently I said that the epidemic was over last May and then just yesterday someone forwarded me an article where I'd said I really, I strongly uh, expect there to be a resurgence in winter. Yeah. And why would I have gone to the trouble of signing and producing Great Barrington Declaration if I thought the epidemic was over? 
I mean, that they're, they're, they are based on the most um, fallacious sort of assumptions and, and uh, seek to promote them. And it's, I've never seen this kind of behavior. I do think universities and academic institutions need to stand up strongly and rebuke those people who have actively engaged in these tactics. Mm -hmm. And just finally, I know you are pressed on time. And um, mm -hmm. what is the way forward now? Is this for, for the UK, I mean, for the United Kingdom? And you, you are have, I think, no, Boris Johnson have some sort of exit plan now to reopen the schools gradually and opening up the society. But is this the new normal? Will politicians, based on supposed threats from viruses or bacteria or fungi, uh, be able to close down our society, uh, break down democratic uh, progression that has taken centuries to evolve? Well, I, I, I certainly, uh, I, I think that right now, because there's, there's two parts to this question, I guess. One is what should we do now? We have vaccines that protect against disease and death. So they offer the focus protection. We've had, you asked me a question earlier about how can we do this? Well, that, you know, that's something we can argue about. I don't think we can argue about whether vaccines can offer focus protection or not. They absolutely do. So I think this is the time to vaccinate the vulnerable or indeed even before that, to protect them until they get vaccinated and open up immediately everywhere. Um, in terms of the damage that's been done by some of these mitigation strategies, um, I think that what's very important is to uh, analyze that damage. And at the, we have set up an enterprise called Collateral Global to look at both the harms and also the benefits, if you, you know, there may be some, some there may be lessons at least to be learned from mm. the impositions. So we've set up um, this project that will be looking at these and, and uh, we hope that in the future, at least the costs of these mitigation strategies will be on the table. Mm. The other dimensions which, um, uh, you know, have to do with how we want to live our lives in the first place are, are also a critical consideration. And uh, I hope that we will next time think about those as well. And mostly I hope we will remember how precious children are yeah. and how our obligations towards children, yeah. how they override almost everything. So in my opinion. Yeah, Netra Gupta, thank you so much for, for coming and for your very wise comments. Uh, hope to maybe see you someday again. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.